Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is watching us. And I'm saying that because uh, we are from from all over the world, from world, from different corners. And uh, for example, in my my place, it's, it's pitch black. It's dark outside. Uh, welcome to to another International Autoimmune Encephalitis webinar that addresses um, very uh, ardent questions that you you raised for us as patients and as care caregivers. Today I have with us a person who is very uh, dedicated to their work, who is a very kind and um, wonderful person, a wonderful doctor uh, that's treating um, autoimmune encephalitis and other neuroimmunology disorder. His name is Jeffrey Gelfand. He's a neurologist at UCSF. He um, specializes in caring for patients with autoimmune conditions, um, inflammatory and neurodegenerative um, neurological conditions. Um, he has experience in multiple sclerosis, autoimmune encephalitis, transverse myelitis, uh, optic neuritis, uh, central nervous system vasculitis, or autoimmune dementias, and um, paraneuropathic neurological syndromes, and uh, many others. And um, he um, also treats uh, neurological problems in patients with rheumatic disease and other systemic illnesses and cares for people in with general neurological disorders. So he's a, he's a doctor that uh, deeply knows and understands the neurological um, spectrum of neuroimmunology disease. He received his medical degree uh, from uh, Harvard Medical School. And then he moved across the country to, to uh, California, to UCSF. Um, he completed a, a, their a residency in neurology, followed the fellow, fellowship in training in multiple sclerosis and neuroimmunology, and has a master's in advanced study degree in clinical research from UCSF. So he uh, sees patients and does research, to, to say it briefly. Uh, so he's. Uh, we consider that he's the best person that could help us better understand the world of clinical trials, because um, the situation in autoimmune encephalitis is um, shifting towards getting new treatments approved in in the care of of patients with autoimmune encephalitis in seeing whether um, current treatments can get um, can work better or how are they are are they working so compared to for example when i got uh, autoimmune encephalitis 10 years ago there was no clinical trial available for me so i couldn't benefit from from that and the, the spectrum of the treatments was very limited and unfortunately for that is changing nowadays and um, if you have questions during the the 45 minutes presentation you can pop them into q and a and at the end we will have a 10 15 minutes um, session for answering these um, these questions that you might have. And I am going to uh, pass the mic to uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Gelfand, who is going to talk to us about clinical trials in autoimmune encephalitis. Thank you so much for the warm introduction and for the kind invitation. This is su such an important topic, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present and, and share um, some of our thinking on the importance of clinical trials in autoimmune encephalitis. These are my disclosures, and I'm going to be um, speaking from my role as an um, associate professor at UCSF in neurology. Just to set the stage, and, and I'm going to be brief here, um, with the focus on clinical trials, 
Um, when I talk about encephalitis, we're talking about a brain inflammation. Um, encephalopathy means an impairment of brain structure or function, and there are many, many causes. And encephalitis means inflammation of the brain. And there are many types of encephalitis. And when I see a patient with a clinical syndrome of encephalitis, and this is relevant as we think about um, how you design trials, one of the first questions is, what's the cause? One, is it encephalitis or is there some other cause of the brain um, dysfunction, the thinking dysfunction? And then if it is encephalitis, is it inflammatory or is it infectious? And if it's inflammatory, we usually think of it as autoimmune or um, perineal plastic, although there's a big overlap between these. Another way of saying this is that many um, autoimmune disorders sometimes have a perineoplastic overlap and sometimes don't. So another way of thinking about this is that traditionally we think of antibody, whether an, um, an encephalitis has an antibody associated with it. And if that antibody targets an antigen in the cell surface on the, the surface of neurons that's accessible on the outside and affects nerve functioning, and those are particularly responsive to immunosuppression or whether the antibody is associated with an antigen, a target in the, the cell itself on the inside, I mean, often in the nucleus, and sometimes those are associated with it, an immune response to cancer. And that's called a perineoplastic disorder. And this has been um, increasing in terms of identifying new antibodies. Um, and there are several tests that we send for antibodies, including um, what's called a cell-based assay, where a person's spinal fluid or blood is sent for an antibody to test and stained for known antigens, as well as stained against rodent brain slices to see, is there a pattern that's consistent with a known antigen or even a novel antigen, or is the encephalitis not associated with a known antibody? And there are formal consensus um, diagnostic criteria to define autoimmune encephalitis, and it's typically defined as a subacute onset, a rapid progression of working memory deficits, altered mental status, or neuropsychiatric symptoms, and then evidence of the inflama inflammation and the inflammatory component to support the diagnosis, and if there's an antibody using that for support for the syndrome as well. Now, about half of all people with autoimmune encephalitis do not have a known antibody, and that's called seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. And the um, potential causes are we either haven't discovered the antibody or not everything is antibody driven in terms of the inflammation of encephalitis. Now, one of the big things that you need to be able to advance research in a field and do clinical trials are clear definitions. And so by having um, definitions, working definitions that continue to get updated and refined. Um, this is one of the sort of prerequisites of being able to now advance um, this into studies. And so this is going to be the foundation for what we're talking about. Another way of looking at this is that in if we look at causes of encephalitis, um, about half of all cases to about a third of all cases are still not definitely figured out of whether it's infectious or autoimmune inflammatory, but that number has been coming down. And a lot of that has been the advance in identifying new antibodies and new autoimmune syndromes. And the key thing here is that autoimmune encephalitis is now as common as infectious encephalitis in several modern epidemiologic series. And a lot of that relates to better recognition. And so the idea is autoimmune encephalitis is rare, but it's not that rare. And it's really important that we study this and re really important that we study what works to treat patients. So when we look at usual treatment approaches, most talks start like this. Here's how we treat autoimmune encephalitis. And I'm gonna ask you every time we do this to say, how do we know what we know? And that's really the main theme of this talk, which is that we need research to be able to address how do we know what we know. So typically, when people present with autoimmune encephalitis, we offer acute or first-line therapy, typically with glucocorticoids, and these are also known as steroids, and then often offer either 
intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma exchange as well. Um, and these work quickly. And the idea is to bring down the harmful inflammation as soon as possible. And often these treatments are even started empirically, meaning best guess treatment, even while clarifying the diagnosis. We might make a clinical diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis based on those criteria and our clinical judgment, and then send off antibody testing. And while we're waiting for those to come back, um, many clinicians will start treatment, for example, with glucocorticoid steroids, and may in some cases also add IVIG or plasma exchange. And then in many cases, clinicians use their best judgment based on our experience and what's been published in the literature based on studying how people have done and comparing notes in what's called the peer-reviewed literature, where we really try to understand what works and what doesn't, or at least we try to sort that out based on our analyses of, of um, the experience, other immune treatments, and these are often called steroid sparing. Sometimes they're called second line treatments, um, if this is first line. And the idea here is to reduce the harmful inflammation of autoimmune encephalitis and to have a treatment that can be taken for several weeks to many months or even a couple years. And there's several different strategies that, that have been used. Um, and then in some cases, particularly if a, an encephalitis is predicted to last for a longer period of time, such as for a few years, there may be a need for longer term treatment, which may be the same as this, or it may be a different immunosuppressive agent that people can tolerate better over time for longer term. So this is sort of a conceptual framework. Now, of course, it's super important to also complement this with symptom management therapy, and there'd be an entirely separate slide and talks for that, and also um, to focus on repair and neurorehabilitation. And in the future, my hope is that there's also going to be a role for physiologic treatments, for nerve protection, and for treatments that target nerve function and repair beyond just inflammation. But for now, um, most of the evidence focuses on targeting the harmful inflammation of autoimmune encephalitis, trying to bring that down while reducing the risk of lowering inflammation in other directions. And so how do doctors do this? And I just want to sort of give a, a sense of, of what we call the regulatory framework. So another way of saying this is without clinical trials, how can we even use a medicine for autoimmune encephalitis? And so it, in the United States, new medicines require regulatory approval to be prescribed and to be marketed. And originally, when I say originally, the states back to the 1930s, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration only required evidence of safety, not efficacy, not that the drug worked, just that it was safe. In 1962, that was changed to require that new medications be both safe and effective. And so to bring a completely new medicine to, medicine, to, to the market, for at least some indication, it needs to be proven that a medicine has acceptable safety and that there's effectiveness, that it works for what we're trying to treat. And the FDA currently provides approvals for specific indications. And this is sort of a term of, of, of art here. So an indication basically means a disease such as autoimmune encephalitis, or more specifically, anti-NMDA encephalitis, or anti-LGI1 encephalitis, or seronegative encephalitis, and a population. A population might be saying adults with autoimmune encephalitis, or adolescents, or children. And, and, and you can get pretty specific as to what the indication is. In the United States, doctors can prescribe existing medicines that are approved for at least another indication. And this is what's called off-label prescribing. It is legal and it's common. In fact, in many fields, off-label prescribing is widespread. And one field where this is very widespread um, is pediatrics, because many medications do not have specific pediatric indications. And off-label prescribing is common in many countries worldwide, um, although specific rules differ by country and region. And so 
An example is that rituximab in 2023 is licensed by the US FDA for certain indications. And I just list a, a couple examples. For example, certain blood cancers, as well as a few specific autoimmune diseases, one of them being rheumatoid arthritis. However, doctors routinely prescribe rituximab off-label for other autoimmune diseases, including autoimmune encephalitis. And currently, there's no licensed um, indication yet um, for, of, in the sort of modern era for autoimmune um, encephalitis, but we use off-label treatments based on our best judgment and evidence and the state of the literature, the state of the evidence. Now, what does evidence mean? So evidence matters in medicine. And whenever we talk about evidence, we mean data, um, actual support that what we think is happening is really happening. And we want that to be high quality. And the concept of applying data to and using clinical research and clinical science coupled with clinical judgment and patient preferences to inform medical decisions is called evidence-based medicine. And this is really the modern um, archetype of how we practice medicine. And it's almost amazing to think back and say, wasn't it always this way? But it really wasn't. For many centuries, medicine was based on more dogma than data or more theory or belief. And it's only in more recent times that the idea of systematically studying and applying science and scientific methods um, to collecting the data and using that to inform how we practice medicine has really taken hold. And this is now part of standard training in medical schools. This is how doctors communicate. This is what's in medical journals and that's called evidence-based medicine. A few other terms, clinical research basically just means all medical research that involves people. It's human-based research. And that's different from other research where it doesn't involve people. For example, if someone studies um, plants or studies bacteria, that's um, you know really important science, um, but that's not clinical research under this definition. And there are several types of studies in clinical research, epidemiologic studies, for example, the, some of the evidence I showed you of how common autoimmune encephalitis is, um, comes from the study of how common a particular disease is, and that's called epidemiology or, or what might cause a particular disease. Observational research means we observe, but we're not intervening in the study. And, and so an example of this might be a study where people look back and say, what's the clinical picture, what's the clinical details of people with NMDA encephalitis or anti-LGI1 encephalitis seen in a particular context over the last certain years? Or what do MRI findings look like? What are the symptoms? Um, or even of the treatments that were given clinically outside of research, in this off-label concept, what seems to work and what doesn't. That's called an observational study. An interventional study of one type of which is a clinical trial that we're gonna talk about in great detail, you provide some sort of intervention and, and whether this is a new treatment, like a new medication, or whether it's some other intervention, physical therapy or an educational intervention, you then study how this works. And so clinical trials are a specific type of research study that measures how an intervention, such as a medication, affects health outcomes. So why even bother doing a clinical trial? Now, there's several reasons, and I want to spend some time really going over these. Number one is to find out if existing treatments that we think work based on our observational studies and based on our clinical experience, truly are effective in this context. And also to find out if an existing treatment is effective for this new indication. So I would give an example, if we use that example of rituximab, you could say like today, doctors in many 
um, areas of the world can prescribe that off label for autoimmune encephalitis, but to really determine in a clinical trial sense, whether it works for this indication of what we're studying, whether it's autoimmune encephalitis or specific types of, of autoimmune encephalitis, such as anti-NMDA encephalitis or LJ1 encephalitis or other antibodies or non, um, you know, antibody negative encephalitis, we could do a clinical trial to try to get the highest quality of data, the highest quality of evidence, and prove that that works even for this indication, even if that may ultimately not go down the pathway of licensure, it still provides data. The other reason to do a clinical trial is to determine if a new treatment, a new medicine that's not yet available to the world or to the particular country where someone is, is both safe and effective for a given disease, a given indication and in population. So the only way for a brand new treatment to become available in the US is for it to become FDA approved for at least one indication. And you have to do a clinical trial, and in some cases, more than one clinical trial to build that support. And then very practically, High quality evidence heavily informs decisions by third party payers, also known as insurance companies, and by health systems, including systems that determine which medicines are on a formulary, which medicines are readily able to be prescribed without a, a, a lot of appeals and, and discussion, and how they make that list. And the people who are in charge of determining whether something is considered a, a, a a common treatment for that condition in that system will look to clinical trials for the highest quality of evidence to support that um, um, either listing in the formulary or support that they want to pay for that treatment that the doctor is recommending and the patient wishes to proceed with. So in summary, a well-conducted clinical trial provides the highest quality of scientific evidence that we currently know how to provide in medicine. And so if you think about how a new drug, new to the world, comes to development, this is sometimes called the drug development pipeline. And before we do any studies in people, there's what's called a preclinical phase, and this is called discovery. So it's like the basic science and the original core scientific discovery, and then preclinical development. So let's say that um, scientists discover that there's um, a new pathway or a, a really clever way to go after the immune system, and we think that this is really important in autoimmune encephalitis. You can validate and figure out what that target is in the immune system, and then develop different model systems in the dish or in animal models or in other um, ways of, of trying to understand if you affect that target, does it seem to help our model of the disease? And then you do additional tests for safety, for toxicology, for pharmacology to try to figure out um, how it would be taken up by the body and processed and excreted? How um, safe does it seem to be even before the first person ever takes the medicine or gets exposed to it? The next step is what's called clinical development. And there are several phases, one, two, three, four. And you will hear these terms in clinical trials. And I want to provide some education about what these mean, because you will look and say, do, um, you know, this is a phase two study, a phase one study, a, a phase four study, phase three study, et cetera. And I want you to understand what that means. So phase one is about safety and dosing. So these are often what are called first in human studies or first in disease studies. And so depending on the medication, sometimes the first studies are in healthy volunteers um, who volunteer to advance clinical research. And test just the sort of general effects of what happens when you take the medicine and they give increasing doses of the medicine to say, is there some sort of point where we say that's the sweet spot and let's not push past that. And in some 
conditions, sometimes the first time you um, do these studies in people are with people with the um, disease and, and who volunteer for this. It also provides an additional scientific learning opportunity to make sure you're really hitting the target that you think you're hitting, um, that it's, you can look at what's called biomarkers, you know, is it affecting um, the person and the biology in the way we think it is? And you can also measure, is the dose right? Um, how does it seem to be taken up or metabolized by the body, et cetera? Sometimes this is done in what's called a phase one and two program to accelerate, where you do sort of part one and part two together. Phase two is the next step. And whereas phase one, as a reminder, was really, is the medication starting to look safe and do we have the right dose? The next step is, does it look like it's working? Efficacy. Is it effective? And also to get more data about safety, what's called adverse effects. And typically these studies last several months to a couple of years, depending on the disease. And there may be dozens to several hundred subjects, depending on the condition. And these are often considered shorter term or exploratory or proof of principle to make sure that you're getting a signal that it's working and that it's working the way you think it is and that the dose that we are giving um, looks sufficient and correct. And in many contexts, the results from a phase two study will directly inform the design of a phase three study Whereas in some cases, a mature phase two study may really help propel things forward and provide information for regulators. A phase three study is, is, is really designed as, as the most mature of the clinical trials to try to prove whether there is efficacy, whether it works, and whether there are um, adverse reactions to build out the safety profile. Typically, these last one to a few years, and there may be a hundred to, depending on the condition, several thousand people, depending on the disease under study. And typically, um, the outcome, the measurement that you're saying, how do I know whether it works, will be a clinical outcome and not just a biomarker outcome. So an example of this is that, for example, in a phase two study, we might say, um, you know, we could use some other measurement like a blood test or a um, MRI or an antibody test. Um, you might also use a clinical um, outcome, but sometimes we will use a biomarker. In a phase three, we really want um, as much clinical endpoints as possible. And, and so an example of this, if you think about vaccines, I'm going to pick something totally different. So if we think about um, vaccines, um, you would do a phase one study in, in unaffected people just to make sure that that um, you are starting to get the right safety signal and dosing. Then you would move typically into a phase two study and you might say, does the vaccine lead to an antibody response? But to really prove whether something works, you then need a clinical outcome. Are there less infections of the vaccine I'm trying to give. Not just do people make antibodies, but are actual real world infections less? That's an example of a clinical outcome. So for um, autoimmune encephalitis, one of the major questions has been, what are the best measurements, the best outcomes for both the phase two and phase three programs? And I'll show some um, examples of that. But really at the end of the day, it's real world clinical outcomes, you know, how people are doing overall that give the best support for whether a medication is effective. And then there can be a phase four program where once a medication is approved or licensed for that indication, there may be more studies to try to understand additional safety, additional details about how well it works, additional nuances. Sometimes this is called post-marketing surveillance. And these studies may be in initiated by scientists, by doctors, by the manufacturer, or even guided or required by regulators saying, we will approve the medicine, but we expect you to do more research going forward. So why might one choose to participate in a clinical trial? And this has been well studied 
in terms of interviewing people. And the three main themes, and I'm just referencing the National Institute of Health, which put much of this together um, as well. Um, and this is very consistent with, with my clinical experience and personal experience, is that one is to help others by helping to advance medical science. You wanna volunteer to help improve science for our understanding of a particular medical condition. Another reason may be to access the newest potential treatments, including treatments that aren't yet available because they need further evidence of their efficacy and their safety. And then another reason is to benefit from the additional care, attention, and close monitoring of the study team. Another way of looking at this is that clinical trials have study visits with dedicated study teams, with doctors, research coordinators, and other health professionals. And uh, people um, will get evaluated very formally in each of these check-ins and anytime they need it in between the check-ins. And that additional care and attention um, can be another reason to want to be part of the research enterprise as well. Now, um, you, if we say, I'm interested in a clinical trial, what happens? And I'm going to talk about clinical trials, but I just wanted to, um, you know, specific clinical trials, but I wanted to sort, sort of um, outline what this means. So let's say that someone says, there's a clinical trial that I want to be part of in autoimmune encephalitis. What happens? And the first thing is that um, you get referred to a place that's doing the trial. And there are particular study sites or study centers that have been approved by their ethics committees that have all the resources to do the study properly and safely and are ready to go to do this right. And um, so, so the first thing is to make a connection with a study center. And then people go through what's called screening. And this is a process where the study investigator and the team will review is someone eligible? Do they meet all the safety criteria? And is there any reason where it's not in their best medical interest to proceed or scientifically any reason where they just don't qualify? Sometimes this is based on just looking at records and, and talking with the team, but in many cases, this also is based on blood tests and physical examination and, and really how, um, how someone is with their condition at that moment in time. And so that's called screening. And some people pass screening and move on to the next step, and some people don't. To even start the screening process, there is a initial discussion about consent. And so often there'll be a, um, a period where um, a person will say, talk to the study site and say, tell me more about the study. I'd love to learn more. And they may also talk with their referring or treating doctors. They'll review the consent forms and the paperwork. They will have an interactive discussion with the study team that's part of the consent process to make sure they understand, is this something they want to do? And then if so, enter the screening. Now, let's say they pass the screening from a safety standpoint and still want to proceed. Then in a randomized clinical trial, people will be randomly assigned to either a control group that has to be defined as to what the control intervention is. And sometimes this is what's called a placebo, which is a medication that looks and is given in the same way as the experimental treatment. So if the experimental treatment's a pill, it'll be a pill that's meant to look and you know be like that. Or if it's an infusion, it'll be um, you know the, the a, a bag of of um, of um, liquid, you know, typically like like a, a saline type solution that on the outside will look identical to what the experimental treatment is. And people will be randomly assigned to either this group or this group. Now, if a clinical trial does not have randomization, it's called open label. And there's just one arm, which is the experimental 
treatment. And But we'll talk about the advantages of why having a control group, a comparison group, is so important for the science. And then people stay in the treatment group for as long as they're comfortable staying in the study and as long as the study team thinks it's still in their best interest. And there's very specific guidelines and protocols for how um, to handle the situation and advise um, people about their best medical interest if there's a worsening of their condition while in either of these groups, including whether their participation in the study ends or whether it makes sense to offer additional treatments such as what's called a rescue therapy, such as like more steroids or more IVIG or plasma exchange. Um, and then at some point, the study ends. And so these are defined. So for example, it'll be, this is a one-year study. This is a two-year study. And then there can be the option to continue on the study medication or continue in the study in some form um, very explicitly in, in what people agree to, to continue to keep doing this to learn more about the longer term effects if they so wish. And that's called an open label extension. So essentially you come in, decide if you wanna participate, you screen for safety, and then you are randomized to either this treatment or this treatment. And then there's a measurement of, is it benefiting people in the way that we think it is? How is it tolerated? And we study that. So why randomize? Why don't we do studies where we just give everyone the new medicine and just see what happens? And the reason is that there is something called bias. And in this specific science sense, bias means non-random systematic error. In other words, it's a deviation from the truth in the results because of something systematic in how we did the study. And bias can go in either direction, looking like something's more or less effective or more or less safe, depending on what's going on. And that's different from imprecision, which is random error, and we try to address that by having enough people in the study. You know, if you do a study with five people, depending on the question, you might learn just the initial um, measurements of, of what, what's happening immunologically. Is it generally tolerated? But there's too much chance of random error about whether it's working or not to make big conclusions. So we have to have a large enough study, a large enough sample size to have the statistical support to try to reduce the chance of imprecision. And then we have to have a properly designed study to reduce the chance of systematically biasing our results. And so as an example, if we give, let's say we're all very excited about a new treatment and then we give 10 people that new treatment, the doctors know what the new treatment is, the participants in the study know what the new treatment is, there can sometimes be a bias, a, a tendency to want to that treatment to work. And so we say, are you feeling better? And you know, there may be either conscious or subconscious reasons why people may say that they're feeling better or less better, or the doctor may rate them as, you know, it's sort of on the fence, but I think they're better here if they know, well, because I think that they're on this new treatment. And so one way that randomization helps is by reducing that as well as other types of systematic bias that may go into an observational study. So another way of saying this is that it's much, much easier to do an observational study as opposed to a clinical trial in terms of logistics, in terms of cost. And observational studies have scientific value for sure. I do them myself and am a big supporter of the importance of observational research. But inherently, they suffer from the design of certain biases that can affect our interpretation. And there's a whole field of science, we call it epidemiology, that studies how to reduce this bias in research. And so clinical trials standardize who is studied, how treatments are given, and how outcomes are measured to provide the highest level of evidence we have about whether a treatment works. And so random randomization randomly assigns participants to a specific intervention. And the beauty of this 
scientifically is that it has the benefit of randomizing anything that can systematically distort the results. If we think that we know something could affect the results, you might just adjust for that statistically in an observational study or try to, um, but there's, what if it's something you haven't even thought of or something that's unmeasured? That's called an unmeasured confounder. And the really elegance of what randomized trials do is randomly sort that out to reduce that chance and to get you closer to scientific truth. Now, why do a double blind trial? Not all randomized studies are blinded. If we go back here, we might say people are randomized, but both the participant and the researchers both know which treatment someone is given, and you still measure that. And that's good in terms of reducing bias in some sense, but it's not as good as what's called blinding. And blinding means that um, both the participant and the study investigators, this is where the double blind comes in, if both are not aware, if both are blinded to, not told, not aware of the treatment assignment, and then move forward with the study. So for example, if I am the participant in a study and I'm randomly assigned to either a placebo treatment or the investigational treatment, I will either take the pill or get the infusion, and I don't know whether I'm getting the placebo or the medication, and the people helping to do the study don't know either. The only people that do know are the pharmacist and some of um, the people behind the scenes who help with the randomization. Now, blinding can absolutely be broken when needed for safety in an emergency. You know, if someone comes in and we really need to know what's going on, you there's procedures for how to handle that. Um, but we try um, to keep the blinding going in a study for the purpose of really getting the, the most scientifically closest to truth answer we can. This is why blinding matters. We might say, I can understand why people do that, um, but I probably can suppress that. And, and this was actually studied in MS, in multiple sclerosis. And this was a clinical trial um, of a new treatment in MS. And the neurologists who were unblinded, they knew whether the participant was treated with the placebo or the study medicine. It turns out after the fact, they graded the neurologic exam in a systematically different way than the neurologists who were blinded to the treatment assignment. Essentially showing even very well-meaning neurologists were subject to this bias if they were unblinded versus being blinded. And so in this case, blinding was proven to prevent an erroneous conclusion. If you hadn't blinded, we would have thought that this medicine worked when the really closer to the answer to the truth was, it really doesn't work. And that could have hurt people. And so by doing the study correctly, this way we can get closer to truth and do right by the people that we're caring for and the people that we love and want to um, protect in terms of who um, we may support um, as participants in a trial, um, if we're the participant or the family. So there's a few other terms that I just wanted to go over. When you look at a clinical trial, you will say, what's the inclusion or the exclusion criteria? It basically means who can participate. And so an inclusion criteria might say someone with anti-NMDA encephalitis or anti-LG1 encephalitis, and here's how we define it. The protocol is the document that provides the trial plan in great detail. And these are usually quite massive documents with, with an extraordinary amount of detail discussing if this, then that, and here's what happens. The sponsor is who's responsible for planning, monitoring, or financing the study. We talked about what a placebo is. Usual care means um, the usual thing that would happen in your medical center or your region for that condition. And then the investigational drug is what's being studied. Now the study center, as I talked about, is a specialized center that has all the permissions and ethics committees and resources to do the research properly and keep participants safe. And then the consent is the permission process to make sure that all people who join a trial do it voluntarily 
and understand the risks and understand the potential benefits. And all trials are reviewed and approved by an ethics committee. And ethics committees are local and regional in, in um, most places. And research ethics are a major, major part of trial design review and conduct. Like this is front and center in the conduct of every clinical trial. So the questions to ask are, why is the trial being done? What are the risks? What are the potential benefits? What would be the usual care be if I didn't participate? And the sort of always the, the, the ground truth is that research studies are only for people that wish to take part. And it's also true that a participant can elect to leave a study at any time for any reason. And it's just really important to make sure that participants understand all their rights, understand all the ethics and understand um, their protections in the process. And so um, in, in terms of clinical trials in autoimmune encephalitis, this is an exciting time. There's several major studies currently ongoing and I summarize um, these here. Um, there are three major randomized placebo controlled trials in the United States currently. Um, one is called uh, the Cielo study, studying, uh, studying a, a new therapy called satralizumab, an anti-IL-6 receptor treatment. Um, it's a phase three study. It's studying people with both NMDA encephalitis and LGI1 encephalitis. And I'll talk about some of the nuances and specifics there. There's the extinguished study that's studying NM, anti-NMDAR um, encephalitis with a therapy called inebolizumab, which targets um, particular kinds of B cells, um, CD19 positive B cells um, that, that are um, including plasma blasts. And this is a phase um, 2B study. It's placebo controlled and, and blinded and um, looking at these clinical endpoints that I list here. And I'll talk a little more about that as well. There's another study in LGI-1, the AIE-01 study, testing a medicine called rosanolixizumab, which um, is, targets the neonatal FC receptor. It helps to reduce IgG levels um, that are circulating. And this is a phase two placebo-controlled study, and they're testing the proportion of seizure-free participants. Now, if we look globally, I can make this list even longer, and this is exciting too. And there's also studies testing um, therapies that are often used off-label or just maybe existing off-label to determine if they're effective and safe for this indication for encephalitis. And here, some of these studies um, are autoimmune encephalitis more generally rather than a specific antibody while well, some of them are more specific as well. And this is all from clinicaltrials.com. So I'm just gonna give a couple examples of what studies look like. Um, this, this is shared from my colleague, um, Dr. Stacy Clardy, who, who's um, the PI of the Extinguished Study. And so this is, is a um, randomized clinical trial where people present with NMDA encephalitis they would receive the IV steroids and either IVIG and or plasma phoresis. And then if they wish to proceed, they're, they're as part of this process, they're screened and then randomized to either the inebolizumab treatment or the placebo IV and then continue. And if there's a worsening, there's the option for additional rescue treatments and then a measurement of, is this effective? And these are measurements that are focused on neurologic and overall disability, and then measure additional outcomes and continue studying people for safety. And so um, this study is really trying to answer whether this therapy, the nebulizumab, will improve clinical outcomes in people with NMDA encephalitis. There's also a, an approach called a basket study where you use one trial infrastructure to study a new treatment um, in several related diseases. And so he, the example I'm going to show you is the Cielo study of satralizumab in two distinct but related autoimmune encephalitis conditions, LGI-1 and NMDAR encephalitis. In other words, these are two separate studies all under the same master protocol on, on, in the same basket 
leveraging the same trial infrastructure. There's another example of what's called a platform study to test several different treatments within the same disease where the trial infrastructure stays, but people keep rotating the treatments in and out. And there's good examples of that in ALS and motor neuron disease, but this likely requires a different funding model to sustain a network rather than individual studies, but it could have future potential in AE. And so the Cielo study in autoimmune encephalitis is a phase three double-blinded multi-center study of satralizumab that affects this IL-6 receptor, the immune system. And the goal is to recruit from people in 16 countries at over 85 sites. So a truly global effort. This is a basket study. So there's one trial in NMDAR and another in LGI-1. And each arm stands on its own. And so the efficiency here is that you leverage the same trial infrastructure to answer several questions at once. Does it work in helping people with anti-NMDAR encephalitis? Does it work in LGI-1? Does it work in both? And, and trying to um, answer that with, with all the logistical effort that's put in. For this study, participants have to have either NMDA or LGI-1. And there's two choices. People can either use this as first-line therapy. All participants are, are um, treated um, with um, steroids, and there's the option of, of the IVIG and, and plasma um, exchange, and, and with um, um, the IVIG and plasma exchange, so steroids and IVIG and plasma exchange. And then you have the choice, if it's within six weeks of when the disease started, um, to um, come in and test whether you get randomized to either satralizumab or placebo um, as the acute first-line therapy. Um, and this would be if there's no other treatment. Now, there's also the option, so this is more of a traditional trial design. There's also the option for what's called an incomplete responder, where if someone was given their acute first-line therapy and then treated with another immunotherapy. Let's say it was rituximab, or let's say it was, um, you know, another agent, um, the, the, like an oral agent, um, and it wasn't. People weren't getting better. They have the option to join the trial and then add on the satralizumab on top of that other treatment that they already got. So there's two choices here in terms of whether it's the more traditional placebo-controlled first-line new-onset treatment or whether people wish to come in even after getting another treatment initially and if they still aren't getting as better as much as hoped to have the option to join the trial and randomly be assigned to either the satralizumab or the placebo. Here's a model of this. So if someone is, has NMDA or encephalitis, they're randomized to either the satralizumab or the placebo. And then if they're in that incomplete responder group to have other immune treatment, and same thing for LGI-1, and then measure the outcome. And then there's the option for the open label extension. And so the goal after the end of this study will be to answer, does the medicine work for NMDAR encephalitis? And does it work for LGI-1 encephalitis? Um, both one or neither. And does what is the safety profile? How do you find clinical trials? I would encourage you to go to clinicaltrials.gov and you can type in a condition such as autoimmune encephalitis or anti-NMDA encep en receptor encephalitis, et cetera. And this will bring up all the available trials and tell you which study sites are near you. And all major trials must be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So essentially, you know, legitimate mainstream trials are all listed on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and so just a reminder of why someone might choose to participate in the clinical trial in AE is to help others by helping to advance medical science so that we really understand what the best treatments are for AE. Um, to access the newest potential treatments. Um, and I showed some specific examples of that here and to benefit from the additional care attention and close monitoring of the study team. I will stop there and I'm happy to take questions and, and we'll look to our moderator to help guide um, how to order those. Thank you very much. Let me switch to 
to uh, gallery. Thank you so, so, so much. It's been, for me, it's been very clear. Um, and uh, let's have a look at, at the questions. One one thing that uh one question is about the anti god sixty five receptors, but I would like to rephrase it. Maybe, what are the antibodies that are currently being investigated in in a clinical trial? You mentioned you mentioned anti MDR. You mentioned LGI one. Yes. So in in um terms of, of current major um multi center studies um. They're currently recruiting for NMDA encephalitis, that's the CLO and the extinguished study, and then for LGI1 encephalitis, that's the um, the um, CLO study, and then the rosanolexizumab study, the neonatal FC receptor study. Um, as I showed, that there are other st studies globally on um, clinicaltrials.gov, depending on the region. And some of them, I'm just trying to pull this up again as a reference, some of them um, it will, based on my reading of the inclusion criteria, include autoimmune encephalitis um, generally, which would include GAD65, depending on the specifics of that study. So it would be worth reaching out to the investigators of those studies if a participant is in that region to find out more. My hope is that there'll be more studies to be able to study um, anti-GAD um, 65 encephalitis and anti-GAD uh, you know, 65 antibody-associated syndromes. Um, you can search separately, for example, under stiff person syndrome, and there may be, um, you know, if someone has encephalitis and an overlap with stiff person, that could be an option. And then also, um, you know, you can check clinicaltrials.gov occasionally to also see what's new because everything is listed um, when they're about to recruit. Um, but I think, you know, the hope is to be able to prove that that clinical trials can be done effectively and successfully in autoimmune encephalitis, and then to expand this to the many other types of autoimmune encephalitis for which we know and agree that there's great clinical need. Another question that I, again, would like to maybe rephrase. Um, once a drug, a new drug that is being tested is approved for a specific antibody, will it be maybe available to be used as off-label treatment for another uh, antibodies? Yes, it's, it's a, a really important question. And, and so um, if um, a medication receives licensure for a specific indication, then it's on the market in that region, whoever approved the drug. So if I'm speaking about the United States, um, if the FDA approves a medication for say anti-NMDA encephalitis, then it exists as a medicine that can be prescribed for other reasons. And so medically the answer is yes. Um, you know, physicians would be able to prescribe that medicine for other indications if they thought that was in the best interest of their patient and based on the emerging clinical experience. But the big question is whether um, that would be covered, right? And in, in terms of a very practical sense, and that's another reason why it's so important um, to have clinical trials to prove even when we have existing medicines to show evidence that it works for additional indications. You touched a very uh, sensitive subject, coverage, cost coverage, and it can be, uh, we face that a lot, um, and it can be different from country to country, because for example, in the United States, it, it's private insurance, in Europe and other parts of the world is government health insurance and the government covers the, the, the costs so the patient doesn't pay out of pocket. And currently there are no guidelines and no approved therapies. Like basically everything that is used now in autoimmune encephalitis is off label. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
And there are health insurances that cover that. And there are health insurances that say, no, I need more proof. I need to know, I need to cover with more proof to know that it works and it is worth for me to reimburse that. For example, in my case, I, I was diagnosed in Romania and um, IVIG wasn't uh, wasn't reimbursed for, for long term. I got ID, I managed to get IVIG for seven years, but um, rituximab would have been completely out of pocket because the health insurance in that country was not covering the the, the cost at all. So to, to narrow down to my question is how important it is um, to have um, a therapy that is finally approved for a particular use, like a particular antibody, and narrow down to autoimmune encephalitis? Would that ease the patient's access to treatment? Yeah, this is su such an important real-world question in terms of... of the challenges of, of accessing treatments and, and um, affordable treatments and, and um, re really trying to deliver care in a timely fashion as well. Um, I, I think this is a complicated question. I just want to parse out a few things. So, so there can certainly be guidelines or recommendations to use a particular treatment, even if it's not licensed for that indication. So an example might be that there may be a, a consensus among um, the, the medical community based on the evidence that does exist that a particular medicine is considered best to offer for that. And, you know, that may, even if it may be off label. So the indication, um, and so, but that medicine has to already exist in the market, right? It can't be new to science, new to medicine. Um, but many insurers or, or, formulary managers, people that run the local health system may not readily dispense or support that medicine um, if there isn't enough evidence or enough data to support that. And in particular, when there's higher cost medicines, there can be, at least in my clinical experience, you know, a higher bar for, for whether um, third-party payers or, or um, you know, health systems are likely to accept a, a treatment. And so doing clinical trials is so important in terms of being able to either provide the evidence that, that a medicine works for that indication. And it's the only way to get a new medicine um, out in the world for um, if there's no indication yet for that medicine. Um, and when a medicine is indicated for a condition, and sometimes medicines can be very expensive, particularly these new um, medications. And 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 um, you know sometimes the, the um, people who control approvals, whether it's you know insurance or health systems, may not grant that without clinical trial data even if, as I was saying, regulatory-wise or legally, people could, doctors could still prescribe it off-label. So in the real world, clinical trials provide the best access to the highest quality supported, highest evidenced medicines um, so that we can help um, really provide the best um, and efficient treatments for patients. Do we have time for another quick question? Certainly with me. Um, actually, it will be an accumulated question. Sure. Would a patient have to pay to be part of a clinical trial? Because that's that's something that, that we heard from, like patients are worried that they would have to pay to be, to, to or the insurance to cover for them to be in a clinical trial. Yes, it's a really important question. And, and so for, for um, people do not have to pay to be in a clinical trial. And in many cases, the trial will provide some reimbursement that the ethics committee signs off on as a reasonable amount to compensate people for their time 
and and you know travel convenience. Um, it really depends on the study whether all the study treatments are covered by the trial or whether some are covered through insurance. And that will be crystal clear as part of the consent process or needs to be crystal clear as part of the consent process and, and for people to decide if this is a trial that they wish to participate in. I would say most trials in, in this space um, really um, leverage the idea that, that all the study related investigations um, are typically covered through the study, whereas other medical things that happen will be covered through usual care. So I'll give an example. If, if um, someone needs a blood draw for the purpose of the clinical trial, the clinical trial covers that. Um, but if someone, if an MRI is not part of the study and someone needs an MRI by their treating doctor, then that goes through their usual health system. So another way of saying this is that usually study-related costs, if it's explicitly stated, are covered through the trial, but the rest of healthcare still needs to go on through the usual coverage. But this is a I'll super important question to ask because there are some studies that say that they will expect insurance to cover, usual care insurance to cover certain things. And so that's just a super important part of the consent process when, when people decide to join a trial. How can a person like that doesn't live in a, in a, in a city that has um, a site, a clinical trial site, how does a person get to be enrolled in, in a clinical trial? Like they live, yeah. for example, in, in, I don't know, in Arizona, and there is no site there. They would have to come to, to you, to California, to UCSF. How does a person that lives somewhere else get to be enrolled in any clinical trial site? What what are they supposed to be doing? Yeah, so what people do would, would be to, to um, contact the study site and on, on that clinicaltrials.gov page and also um, you know, through Google searching, you know, there's all the um, study investigators and the sites and contacts are listed. Many studies also have, have centralized referral options as well. They would make an appointment to talk with the study site. And usually this is a phone call um, or, or an email correspondence, whatever people prefer, and then decide if it makes sense to, to, to travel um, to that site. And um, typically what, what people would do is, let's say that someone was in a place where they needed to travel to our medical center, um, we, we would talk with them ahead of time and then invite them to come. And then um, in many studies, in, including uh, you know, the ones um, I, I'm talking about that, that, that I'm involved in here, um, the um, studies will have ways of reimbursing travel um, it just has to be explicitly discussed and there are limits. Um, but, but the idea would be that that within the study um, infrastructure and the study um, budgets, there, there's ability to support people to travel if that's a barrier. Um, and so I would encourage people to ask, you know, does that uh, apply to me? And in many cases for clinical trials, it absolutely does. And the goal is to reduce barriers to, from you know, you know, not living near a study center. And for a rare disease like autoimmune encephalitis, it's really, really important to try to make this as easy as possible for participants. And so I really would hope that travel's not a barrier here and that you'd work with your local study site um, to, to make this doable. The other thing is you may also be Can surprised from other that there countries? are... It, it, it can be done or... Um, you know, there, there um, would hopefully be a, a site in that, um, in that um, country or, or um, in that region. And that would, you know, every site has their own um, local rules and, and comfort levels in, in terms of, of how that might work. Um, but, but people travel routinely for access to clinical trials and for clinical trials. And so I would just say, um, ask the question. And in, in many cases, the answer is going to be a big yes. That's, that's that's absolutely wonderful because 
sometimes people think that is more complicated than it actually is. And maybe because they face so many barriers in accessing the treatment or accessing uh, the, um, the right diagnosis place, they think that it's the same ongoing problems with accessing a clinical, a clinical trial if that is needed. So that has been very uh, revealing and, and uh, comforting. Is there any takeaway message that you would finally have to would finally like to to give us? Um, yes, um, just that that, that um, clinical trials are, are just such an important part of, of modern medicine. They provide really, really important, high quality evidence to make sure that um, we're providing the best treatments to patients to advance new treatments and to really make sure that, that we can advance the science for the field. And so I would really encourage people and um, families of, of, of people affected by autoimmune encephalitis, if this speaks to you and if this sounds like something that you would want to volunteer for, because research is voluntary, um, it would be really important to help support the clinical trial efforts. And, um, you know, it's just an exciting time in the field for autoimmune encephalitis to have matured into an era of clinical trials. And that, that is, is, I'm just very excited about the potential for patients in terms of new treatments and a better understanding of treatments so that in what I hope to be the near future and not the long future, we'll be able to be um, do an even better job caring for people with autoimmune encephalitis and helping people heal and recover and just do better overall. Thank you so, so, so much. It, uh, it has been an, an amazing presentation and um, you managed to transform science like very broad, uh, hard scientific language into kind of easy to understand and to, to digest for people with a neurological condition. And um, thank you so, so much. And um, well, let's let's hope that we change some, some perspectives and that uh, it helps people to make more uh, informed and better informed decisions. And we have uh, new medicines approved soon. For, for autoimmune encephalitis. That is our hope. Thank you so, so much again, and have a good day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.